When I came to Chicago in 1927, I was five years old. Our first location residence was at 37th and Cottage Grove. I was raised, uh, in fact, I was born over on Edgewater Avenue. Grace and Broadway, I lived in that neighborhood. And then I moved over to Bell Avenue, which was near uh, Lawrence and Western. I was born in St. Gabriel's Parish, graduated from St. Gabriel's in 1934. That's in Canaryville. I lived uh, on Independence Boulevard for many years. We lived at uh, 37th and Giles. When I was growing up, um, the neighborhoods were wonderful. We'd have block parties where my mother would bring hard boiled eggs or something. That was our picnic in the street. <laughs> in all neighborhoods, there uh, were, was a feeling of closeness, uh, a feeling of neighborliness, a feeling of, of families. We knew everybody in the whole neighborhood. and. Uh, we went to school from the time we were in grammar school up through high school with the same people. You knew the grandmother of, uh, you know, your boyfriend and, uh, or girlfriend. But at that time, everybody knew that somebody was ill, everybody was there to, to bring food in and to take care of these people. Oh, and doctors used to come to the house. In the 1920s, the people who lived in these houses walked these streets and sat on these porches were fully confident that Chicago was going to be the greatest city in the world. Chicago had a lot of vitality and Chicago had a lot of industry and Chicago had a lot of, we had the meat packing plants, we had the steel plants. It was a time of a, a great optimism, a, a sense that this was going to last forever and that uh, uh, the city was uh, going to be the greatest city in the world. Life was much slower. It was uh, uh, not so fast paced. Amusements were a lot of home things, either at your home or someone else's home. Friends would get together. Everybody associated without even calling on the phone, they used to uh, sit on the front porch. Everybody sat on porches and talked to each other, not only next door to each other, but across the street from each other. Um, porches were big things uh, back in those days. Sat on the front porch, and this lady made good pumpkin bread, and that lady made good something else, and then before long, the whole porch was full of people from the neighborhood, and everybody was friendly. You were friends almost immediately. We used to sit on a porch at night, you know, and the wind would come, blow, uh, you know, breeze would come. Or if it was real hot in the house, we didn't have any air conditioning, we didn't have a fan. We used to sleep in the grass or in the yard. We'd put up a blanket and sleep there, you know. We, we loved it. Or we'd walk to the park and sleep, and it was safe. You could go to Dung Douglas Park, Independence, Garfield Park, and sleep in the grass. Nobody would bother you. People would take their blankets and uh, uh, whatever bedding or pillows they had and come sleep at the lake and thought nothing of it. No thought or concern about security because it wasn't a problem. No feeling of, of being uh, uh, approached or, or harmed. We felt so safe. Our neighborhoods were safe. Safe, we'd stay there all night. And that was the kind of a feeling that, that existed in the neighborhoods in those days. We would go and sleep on the grass. A boy, a girl, a boy, a girl. No drinking, no sex, no dope. Just nice, cool grass. As a little girl, we had so much freedom. 
you could be outdoors, anywhere. And, and uh, we play hopscotch. We used to jump rope a lot. I, I had a very happy, carefree childhood. Oh, and then I think the, the best game we ever played was called Kick the Can. We used to play that in an alley. We played house, you know, we had tea. Uh, we played completely different than the kids do today. It was not as planned, it was not as organized. The idea of calling a friend and making a date, that just wasn't done. We just automatically met someplace. Oh, we had a park. There was Washington Park. And at that time, there was a, a lagoon over there. You could rent boats for like maybe 25 cents, go out rowing on the lagoon. And we'd spend all day uh, in the summertime playing baseball in a vacant lot. Those were, those were pleasant days. There were not so many cars. Uh, you could play baseball on the street like I did. We'd play ball on the street. And if a car would want to go by, you'd say, wait a while, one more out. You know, and we thought nothing of the guy would wait. There were far fewer drivers. There weren't that many cars available. People rode streetcars, buses. Not nearly as many families had automobiles. And driver's licenses weren't required. Anybody who had a car could drive it. First driver's license I ever sent for was 50 cents. No examination, no nothing. You sent your name and address and telephone number in and you got the license and the next mail. When uh, people got a car, it was a big deal. Everybody came around to look at it, examine it. Everybody wanted to go for a ride. Everybody didn't have an automobile to go to other neighborhoods. In the 20s, shopping was different because people, they didn't travel around, and so people came to the house. The vendors used to come up and down the alley, and they used to sell fruits and vegetables. Oh, and the ice man used to come, and we used to jump on the wagon, and he used to chip the ice, and there'd be little pieces of ice, and of course, your parents would always say, don't eat it, you'll catch pneumonia, you know. <laughs> in those days, we didn't have refrigerators. You used to put a little sticker in your window that said you wanted ice to stop there. The sign was a square sign. It said 25, 50, 75, 100. So if you, wanted, if you had a big ice box, you could put a big chunk of ice, which would last about three or four days, you know. And then you had a pan underneath, and it was always somebody's job to remember to empty the pan. And if you didn't, you'd sometimes come home and water was all over the floor. And when it did flood the kitchen floor, we were in trouble from our parents. I remember an organ grinder used to come and go up and down the streets. And all the kids would come out and they would throw pennies in the, and the monkey would pick up pennies or whatever. And boy, that monkey was he well trained. He could get those quicker than Carter has pills. The knife sharpener. He would come on a regular schedule and my mother would have the knife, knife ready and we'd get down and he'd sharpen it right out in the alley behind the house. And the milk, of course. They delivered all the milk. We would get our milk in bottles, no less, with the cream on top. They paid it at the end of the week or the end of the month. We had a number of stores nearby that we could walk to, too. We didn't necessarily have to wait for the vendors to come in. They used to have mom and pop stores everywhere. If you wanted bakery goods, you'd go to a baker. If you want meat, you'd go to a butcher's shop. The butcher stores used to stay open till 9 o'clock. Now you could get everything in one place, but the, it lacks the warmth of the old days where you knew everybody and uh, they'd have your pickle ready for you. You couldn't shop once a month like now. We, like now we have a deep freeze. Yes, we went shopping practically every day. There was a little candy store in the neighborhood that I used to go to every Sunday. And you could buy these penny candies. And they made toffee 
in the window. Beautiful ice cream parlors. There was one in every block, and they were nice. Don't you remember the uh, place we used to always go to at uh, Crawford and uh, Irving, the Buffalo? Oh, the Buffalo was a fabulous place. My husband used to say to me every night, how about it, babe? Ready for a hot fun Sunday? The drug stores were usually on the corner. Every other corner had a drug store with booze, but they called it medicine. And if you had a clout, you could buy it. Uh, Chicago was a wide open town. Uh, you had everything in Chicago. Uh, and, uh, my corner was uh, 71st and Stewart, and within a uh, radius of a few yards, not a half block or a block, there were five handbooks where you could go in. We were betting on horses when we were young kids, and we'd bet in the milk store. The, milk, the guy who owned the milk store, ran the milk store, was a bookmaker, and he had very little interest in selling milk. He was selling the races, and we'd chip in a dime apiece. Five guys, you put in a dime. I mean, I'm talking about people who are 13, 14 years old. You could find a bookie on every corner, and you still can. <laughs> Nobody cared. Nobody cared. It was, a, it was, I've always thought of it as an enlightened era. <laughs> In those days, everybody went to the movies. Our mom would give us a quarter. We'd go to the show, to the ice cream parlor, and have money for a White Castle. Most of the movies would uh, change pictures maybe three times a week. Uh, as a youngster, Shirley Temple was my favorite. I used to dream about her. You're not a good woman. You're crazy. you got to be good to get stuff like this neat hard time. She was the greatest little star ever was. She was everybody's darling, everybody's darling. Shirley Temple and Rin Chin Chin, the dog. Many people went once or twice a week. It was a ritual. And they had dish night last night. You get the dishes and glasses, two cents on Tuesday nights. And of course, you'd build yourself a set of dishes. I still have some dishes. I still have some glasses. Theaters in those days are not like the theaters today. Today, they put them up with look like boxes. In the olden days, it was a work of art. All of the theaters in the 20s, you know, were very elaborately decorated on the inside. Uh, very palatial. Beautiful lobby, sometimes three or four stories high. Many of them had a grand staircase where you could go to the balconies from the lobby. Two of the great theaters in my neighborhood were the Marlboro and the Paradise. The Marlboro Theater, just west of Pulaski on Madison, and the Paradise Theater, just north of Madison on Pulaski. Now, the Marlboro was a work of architecture. It was beautiful. The outside had, like, looked like almost like a church. Paradise was my favorite for looks. It was beautiful. It was like walking into a paradise. There were statues in the lobby, and fountains, and the walls were marble. And you walk in, and the clouds are above your head with the stars. It's a different world. And you walked out of there, where was I? <laughs> you know, it was great. There were a lot of smaller theaters. Uh, that we would go to as kids on Saturday afternoon and see the serials. And they'd, they'd break it off, you know, and you'd dying to get back to see what happened the next time. This is Shirley Millen. I'm in the colonnade. Help me. Help. Help. And you used to go every week because you didn't, when they left you, the heroine was dangling from a, a branch over the cliff and, and he was riding on his horse and, you know, and you had to see what happens. <laughs> Public transportation was a fact of life for us when I was growing up. 
We thought nothing of taking a streetcar or se sometimes several. It was the biggest system in the world. At one time it had over 3,500 cars running. The streetcars had a commanding presence and uh, if you, you got in his way, you got hit. When I was driving, I had to watch out for the streetcar, and I mean watch out because they were big. And it was, uh, I don't know, a nickel, then it went up to seven cents, horrors, you know. They used to have stoves on the streetcar on cold days. They have good fire going. The heaters on the cars were always either blazing hot or there was no heat at all, one of the two. Sometimes didn't run on time. But they got there, and they ran, and they ran every place, and they ran frequently. They were fun really fun. In the winter they were cold and whatnot, and they were rocky. They weren't that wobbly. They rode pretty good. People used to get sick on them a lot. They used to have a sandbox in the front of the streetcar. They used to have a sandbox in the front of the streetcar, and when somebody became ill, the conductor would have to go and put sand. They had a sandbox on there for little kids to play in while you were riding the trolleys. You got on in the back, and the conductor took your seven cents. And then you got off at the front. But you could never get off at the back. Never. If you didn't have an uh, uh, extra few pennies for the streetcar, the conductor waved you on and said, go ahead. The conductor would ring the bell twice to tell the motorman up front that everybody was aboard and was OK to proceed. You hear the clang and the, the rope man pulling the rope and all that. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. In those days, uh, it was nothing. All children knew how to get on a streetcar and go to another destination. You never worried about being harmed. We didn't have to be isolated in our own automobile to feel safe. We took the, the streetcar everywhere, everywhere. Navy Pier could be uh, reached by streetcar. Navy Pier was a wonderful place to go in the summertime. I used them to go to, um, to the shows. I used them to go to Riverview Park. They take you everywhere. You could go to the planetarium, the aquarium, Soldier Field, the Field Museum, and right to the door. We take the streetcar to the zoo to see the big gorilla. Uh, I forgot his name. His name was Bushman. Bushman was a six foot two, 550 pound gorilla who was the idol of the of the zoo world, and people from all over the world came here to see Bushman. He was one of the biggest attractions that Chicago's ever had. When we grew up, uh, excitement was to go to the beach, the North Avenue beach, uh, for the day, and for that we had to take the uh, streetcar, so that was an all-day outing. I can remember taking streetcars to funerals out at 111th Street. They would put the, the casket on the front car of the streetcar, and we'd all go on the streetcar. Yeah, we used to take the streetcar, go all the way to the end of the line, and then go all the way back home. On the same streetcar. <laughs> that was our Sunday entertainment. Smelly, dirty, noisy, wonderful. <laughs> The Loop in Chicago was the center of attraction. Everybody would go to the Loop for work, for theaters, for restaurants, and you'd always go by public transportation. For excitement, everybody had to go downtown to see what was going on. The Loop in those days was crowded. It was busy, it was exciting, there was a bustle in the air. There were no shopping malls, and everybody went downtown to do their shopping. Well, the Loop was the center. Madison State was known as the busiest corner in the world. The Boston Star on one side. Mandel Brothers on the other. A two blocks down is the Fair Store. They were all big stores, all huge stores. In the 20s, of course, Chicago was the railroad center of the world. There were a thousand passenger trains each day that passed through Chicago. Places like Marshall Fields had enormous numbers of out-of-town uh, uh, charge accounts from people who might come from New York and the 20th Century Limited and go out of the city in the afternoon on one of the uh, California trains. And so they'd have a few hours to spend and a few dollars to spend, and uh, Chicago would be the beneficiary of it. The Loop in those days used to be active both during the day and at night. 
we maybe had six or seven legitimate theaters. The Loop had great restaurants in those days. Henrici's was the first of the great restaurants. Well, Henrici's was a very, very fine shop, especially after the theater. Fritzl's was another restaurant we love. 30, 40 dishes on the menu is supreme. Kranz's was across the street from Marshall Field, and they had the best ice cream you ever tasted. Oh, yes. Who could forget Kranz's? It was so beautiful with those curved glass windows in front. And they had little silver dishes filled with uh, whipped cream with little pedestals on. I still remember that so well. My brother and I would stop at Kranz's for ice cream on our way to the theater. And then we would go to th the theater and see the latest movie and the latest uh, stage show. You'd go to see, say, the Chicago Theater, the Oriental Theater. And after the movie, they had a live stage show that might have been an hour, hour and 15 minutes long. Stage show, vaudeville, you know. The big names would come there and people could see them were next to nothing. You'd have a comedian, uh, could be an acrobatic act, and always a dance team. Tommy Darcy and Bob Crosby and Les Brown. In fact, with Betty Goodman on a Saturday, I, I saw three shows. It would be thrilling when you hear the theme song of Benny Goodman or Artie Shaw and you usually get the chill running up and down your spine because the band and that blaring sound of the theme song is you're watching and hearing it. It's beautiful. Then the curtains would close, back to the movie, but we didn't go home. We stayed for another show <laughs> to bring a little lunch. <laughs> the highlight of the shows downtown was Paul Ash. Paul Ash, the fantastic musician with his hair like this. Don't you remember Paul Ash? Mm -hmm. He was at the Oriental for years. The Three Stooges had their rack, and I would stand on the aisle and I'd memorize their lines. Uh, they would say, Nellie bought a new dress, it was really very thin. She asked me how I liked it. I answered with a grin, wait till the sun shines, Nellie. The Loop had everything. Oh, theaters and plays and entertainment. All sorts of people, all day long, activity, even into the evening hours. It was full of people. There was no question about it at any time of day or night. I remember when I was about five years old, I think. The biggest deal to me, my mother would take me onto the streetcar and we'd go to Maxwell Street. They had all used clothes and pots and pans and hot dogs. Oh, well, Maxwell Street was the mecca for getting things cheap, and you would get cheap things, <laughs> you know. During the Depression, the many uh, people, but I think everybody that I knew was going down there. The Depression was a time of great paradox. People worried about finding a work, people worried about paying the rent, people worried about where to buy food. People would come to the back door and ask for food, and my mother would always prepare something and have them sit out on the porch, And but that was common in, in all families, had people come to the door. Economically, it was a very difficult time. And uh, I know that because my husband was in the building business and there just was no building business. But at the same time, there was this feeling of wanting to escape. People needed some way to get away from the problems of the world. They could go to the movies for a very low price. They could go to the beach. Chicago had a great advantage over other cities. have beach in the heart of town, along Michigan Boulevard. Outer Drive is a lake. Very few cities have that. But there was something else. There was an amusement park called River View. A bunch of us, four or five or six of us, we usually go to River View in summer in, in, on two cent day. 
and you could go on any ride for two cents. Usually the ride cost five cents or maybe 10 cents if it was an expensive ride. Well, that was a big sum of money in those days. And oh, when the streetcar stopped in front of the Riverview entrance, it was just a flood of people coming out. It was just beautiful. I went to Riverview well, a thousand times. I had four sisters and we went, the whole army of us, whole army, including one time we dragged my mother. Come on, let's go. When I was a little kid, whenever we had a birthday cake and you made a wish, my wish was, I want to go to Riverview. <laughs> Riverview at one time was called the world's largest amusement park. And it was situated in Belmont and Western Avenue. I owned the Ferris wheel in Riverview for 27 years, from 1930 until 1957. All the kids used to love it. Yes, the first thing they'd hit was the Ferris wheel, you know. To hear them screaming and yelling, and it was really happy. Aladdin's Castle was, of course, it was a fun house. You would go through these dark passageways, and all of a sudden something would pop up at you out of nowhere, or, or some great giant spider would come down off the wall, you see it was meant to frighten you, or some, those air drafts would, would blow, of course, the skirts of the, of the ladies, you know. That was all part of the fun of the whole thing. Remember the bug house, Molly? Yeah. Where you could go in and spend the whole day. See yourself thin and see yourself fat and short and tall. You couldn't wait to go to the next ride. And one of the big things was the shoot the shoots. You were unlucky and you were in the front row. You got soaked. <laughs> you, you didn't get soaking wet, but you got a lot of spray. It was, it was exciting. I remember going on the parachute, and I couldn't find anybody to go with me. And it takes you up very slowly to the top. And then it hits some kind of device up there, and then this little parachute opens. And uh, you just sort of floated down. Scary, but it was fun. It was a good ride. But I wouldn't do it again. My time was spent on the, was spent on the roller coasters. I loved them. The Bob's, of course, was the ferocious one. That was the steepest one. That was the fastest one. That was the one that you know, was the scariest. Everybody had to go on that. Some people wouldn't go on it. The backseat of the Bob's was always the greatest because uh, as you went over the hill, uh, it just threw you against the safety bar and it really whipped you around beautifully. I didn't like the high ride. I just couldn't stand them, they made me sick. So my job was to stand and hold the purses for the girls. That was thrilling. Riverview didn't have a ride called Tunnel of Love, it was called the Mill on the Floss. Oh, the Mill on the Floss is my favorite ride because it was nice and quiet, and although I never had a boyfriend to cozy up to. One of the differences between Riverview and maybe the old amusement parks and today's theme parks, uh, today's theme parks are antiseptic. They're so clean. The old parks smelled good. Uh, you could go to Aladdin's Castle and the place would stink most of the time. A good smell, though. A nice smell. Riverview was uh, raffish. The word is raffish. Riverview had sideshows. The fat lady, the tattooed man. The crazy mirrors and the freak shows. And it was very, very exciting, especially in the evening when it was lit up. Especially for us kids in the 30s and 40s. Uh, that really was a fantasy land. That was magic to behold. Everybody was happy there. Yeah, that was a place I would miss. Oh, I loved Riverview. I did. And I wish it was still there. Sports were big all during the Depression. The racetracks were filled because people had no money, so they managed to bet it on the horse. Sports was a great relief and a great way to get over your tensions. At that time, Chicago had two professional football teams. The Bears played at Wrigley Field. We also had a second professional football team, and that was the Chicago Cardinals, and they played at Comiskey Park. 
High school football was bigger than college football and pro football in those days. Every year we had a gigantic game where the public league champion played the Catholic League champion, and this was held in Soldier's Field. I think it was 1939. That Austin uh, uh, Leal game was played in uh, 1937. They drew the largest crowd ever for a football game. Leo and uh, Austin drew 120,000 to that game. There were about 125,000 people. 130,000 jammed to see Bill de Corvant and Austin High School defeat Leo. I used to take my mother to Wrigley Field when she'd come up because she had never seen a big league ball game. The Cubs owned town at that time. Uh, the Sox were going nowhere. It was fun watching them because we won games. In those days, going to the bleachers is something you did at the spur of the moment. It's a beautiful day today. Let's go to Cubs Park. We go pay a buck and a half. Uh, the players were more fun-loving, and uh, there was more uh, rapport between the fans and players in those days. Like Gabby Hartnett once posed with Al Capone. This was the greatest Cub team of all time. They called him Murderer's Row. Probably the biggest spectacle of all time was the heavyweight title fight. When Joe Lewis would fight, uh, the whole world would be watching. Joe Lewis came along in 1935, it created a lot of excitement. Uh, mobs would stop him on the street, ask him for autograph. Uh, he was just a hero that everybody worshiped. Uh, you know, I can remember Joe Lewis after every fight, he would always say, Mama, I had another lucky night. The things I miss are, are the, the zany things, and uh, for example, uh, the best example, the six-day bicycle race. And these bicycle riders would ride around the clock. I was too young for this aspect of it, but the best time was about two o'clock in the morning. They'd be riding slowly around the track, and then some politician or some uh, gangster in the balcony would say, uh, $200 to the winner of the next sprint, and away they'd go riding like mad. And it just was so crazy. Al Capone would be there now. Now, I didn't see Al Capone. Everybody talks about a relationship with Al Capone. Unfortunately, I never met Al, although I lived about a block from where his mother lived when I was a little kid. And we used to run around the house after Boy Scout meetings, and we'd always think maybe there's a guard there and he'll come out with a gun. The most kindly, peaceful old lady who ever lived. The Century of Progress was really planned beginning in about 1926 to uh, counter the image of Al Capone and crime-ridden Chicago. Well, Roosevelt came and opened the fair. He was president. It was a, a big, big uh, event in the city. Century of Progress was the only World's Fair that ever made any money. The fair was paid for largely by private investors, uh, including uh, tens of thousands of Chicagoans who couldn't trust banks anymore, and it proved to be a very good investment. It started in 1933, carried over, did so well, it carried over to 1934. And it was right in the area of the planetarium, the Field Museum, and Soldier Field. When it was time for the Century of Progress, 1933 and 34, the streetcar company set up two extra lines very important to get people to and from the, the uh, exposition. My husband built the Swift and Company building, and he worked on the uh, Sky Ride, which was very exciting and scary. The 
sky ride which went from the uh, mainland over what's now Burnham Harbor across to the island which is now Meg's Field. I was scared to death, but people just loved it. I was about 10 years old uh, during the century of progress, and my father had built the, uh, many of the buildings there, and I remember that we were on the top of the administration building when the Italian aviators, led by Balboa, flew in. And I can remember my father saying, they've come all the way from Italy, and we thought it was a miracle. The theme of the fair was Century of Progress, and it showed very modern buildings. They had, like the automobile, they had the autos of the future. And those were big exhibits, big, big buildings. It was an adventure. And I can remember they had uh, chairs that young men would push the chairs. And my grandmother would be pushed all over the fair. And they had big buses. They were open on the sides and they were pulled by a tractor. And you could get on and ride any place in the park. This is a picture of the, all of the people in the Bowery, which was on the midway where, where the uh, honky-tonk and all of the entertainment was. My dad is right in the middle. The, the group of uh, chorus girls were in the front. The headliner, like Tina, she had nothing to do with the chorus girls, and the chorus girls had nothing to do with the showgirls, and it was a very, they used to have terrible fights. There were people from all over the world that came and visited, you know. And well, there were many people from the out, our neighboring states, like Wisconsin and Indiana. We had relatives come from as far away as New York, Schenectady, Hoboken. So many people from downstate came up with their families. Oh, there were such mobs of people that came every, every, every day. It was bringing in a lot of people from all over the world, and it also brought in a, a lot of uh, money to the hotels and the restaurants. So many people came and simply stayed in their cars, and they would uh, stay in, in tourist parks, or uh, sometimes just open fields can often sleep in their cars. And so, deep depression. And yet people came there, you know. Again, it was escape. It was something that Chicago really needed at that time. It gave, certainly gave a feeling of um, encouragement and that things would be better in the future, and they were. People very much believed that technology would lead America out of the Great Depression. I think many people went away from the fair with kind of a renewed optimism about what would happen in the country. It was a very, very great fair. There was something for everyone, no matter what your interest was, you'd find something that would be to your liking. Sally Rand. Sally Rand. Sally Rand. Sally Rand. Sally Rand. Sally Rand. Oh, Sally Rand. Big deal. The star, of course, was Sally Rand, the fan dancer, who was marvelous. Sally was a highly intelligent woman, and she knew exactly what she was doing. Well, Sally Rand, in some areas, was considered naughty. Very exciting to a 15-year-old boy. She was always being arrested, and the more being arrested, the more people she drew. It was camp, you realize, she was very campy. Well, that was Sally. Someone asked me, what was your work during the 30s and 40s? I said, I was a Chicago gangster. And they say, well, what do you mean? I said, in soap operas. I would threaten Ma Perkins, this good, honest, hardworking American woman at a lumber yard. I would, terrible to marry Marlon. And there's an organ that would play Claire de Lune. And the announcer would announce the troubles Mary Marlon had. She suffered more than St. Teresa ever did, Mondays through Fridays courtesy of Oxidol. Chicago was really the center of radio in the 1920s and the 1930s, even into the 40s a, a little bit. The biggest shows that came out of Chicago are household words today, 50, 60 years after the fact. Amos and Andy, Fibber McGee and Molly, The First Nighter, The Breakfast Club. 
Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy, and uh, Ma Perkins, Oxidol's own Ma Perkins, America's mother of the airwaves. Three of the greatest kid shows of all time came out of Chicago radio. We had Little Orphan Annie, we had Captain Midnight, and Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Now, Orphan Annie was number one in kids' radio in the 1930s. da 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 dum 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 It's Orphan Annie time. dum da 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 dum 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 Who do you see? It's Little Orphan Annie. Sandy, uh, the dog, was portrayed by three people. Someone barked, someone growled, and I did the whining or crying. <laughs> Try to sound like a dog. <laughs> Annie was known for her expressions, Annieisms, such as, Leapin' lizards! Come on, we gotta go! Hurry up! <laughs> we used to romp home from school, and we'd listen to every program when we'd send away for Ovaltine mugs and rings that would glow in the dark that would turn your fingers uh, green. And then every week when the program came on, they give you these magic numbers, and then you could decode on your little decoder what these numbers were, and you'd find out a clue to what was going to happen next week. Oh, man, big stuff. If I could, I'd want to bring back the period of the radio. You imagine what they looked like, and you got to know them as friends, and, and uh, they were part of your life. That was the wonderful part of radio, the ability for the child to imagine. The actors provided the, the sounds, the voices. The sound effects man gave us the sound. The musicians set the scenes, but the listener had to decorate the set and costume the actors, so we participated. The family, I remember we used to sit around on Sunday and uh, clean out the refrigerator or icebox set, and uh, we would sit around and listen to all the radio programs. Rochester, did you use my car last night? Well, uh... Rochester, I just found a bobby pin on the front seat. A bobby pin? Yeah. <laughs> what are you laughing at? There's only two of us here, and it ain't mine. <laughs> Jack Benny, Eddie Cantor. My God, whoever missed Eddie Cantor? They were McGee and Molly and uh, all these programs that were... Well, you got to know the people. They were characters you know, that you actually... Say right. became absolutely part of your family. And one man's family, you knew every one of one man's family. Mm -hmm. Paul and all of them. Captain Midnight and Terry and the Pirates and the Lone Ranger. Molly Goldberg, that was a wonderful oh. popular program. Oh, was it Rosie, Sammy, and, and out loud the window. She'd lift the window up and call out. Trevor McGee's closet. You're sure it's in there? Positive. Okay, here I go. <laughs> Gotta straighten out that closet one of these days. <laughs> so to this day, many of us our age, when we have a disorganized closet, we'll say, well, my God, there's another type of gay's closet. When we wanted to watch the uh, radio programs, we would do the same thing that you do with TV today. Everybody would gather around and uh, watch the program, and there, was, there would be no interruptions. I got to the point where I hated anybody to come into my, our house to visit us because I couldn't look at the program. You'd invite people over, man, and sit down and stare at the radio. Well, of course, during the war, we would listen for news to see what was going on. I remember um, very vividly uh, hearing the speech of President Roosevelt when he uh, said we are gonna have to go to war because of those things that had occurred with Japan. I remember very vividly when he got on the radio and made those announcements, yes indeed. The radio was our, uh, our entertainment when we were home. I think the news we, and the music. Late at night, usually after 10 o'clock at night, you could tune into all kinds of different radio stations and pick up the big dance bands from downtown Chicago. You'd listen to uh, music from the Black Hawk restaurant or from uh, the Congress Hotel. They had broadcasts from most of the major hotels downtown. Uh, certainly the, uh, the old Stevens Hotel, which later became the Conrad Hilton. The Sherman House, the College Inn of the Sherman House, or the Sherman Hotel. The Black Hawk Restaurant was one of the biggest name makers for the bands uh, in the country. That's why they used to want to come in at Union Scale. 
at the Blackhawk just to get the airtime. It was great fun to be in on a big band broadcast. In fact, uh, um, I remember my wife and I, she says, oh, don't push in so close, it's not nice. I said, come on, we'll be on the air. And then we'd cheer and holler and everything else, and then people would hear us. And, and, uh, and I'll tell my friends who weren't there, I said, Jeremy on the radio last night. The main clubs for broadcasts in Chicago and, and, and locations were the Aragon and the Trianon. As a matter of fact, the whole country knew the Aragon and the Trianon because of the network pickups out of those ballrooms. When you think of Chicago ballroom, you think of the Aragon and the Trianon, started by the Kaisers brothers. The Trianon, for example, was built to represent the Trianon in uh, France. It was a wonderful place to go and escape. The uh, Aragon ballroom was absolutely gorgeous, just gorgeous. The Wayne King was there for a long time, and. Friday night was waltz night with Wayne King. We met right here at the Aragon in the 40s, right over there. The street line would end at Broadway and Lawrence, and all these dancers would come out, especially the women, with their little suitcases. They looked like bobby socks until they made the change here in the ballroom to dance, and they were just an extreme transformation. And once you walked up the stairs and into this beautiful ballroom, it was just magic. Magic happened. The orchestra the girls in their gowns, the fellas, the terrific dancers we had those days. That was as glamorous as anything could ever be. Well, you would meet servicemen coming there, and if there weren't enough servicemen, the girls would dance with each other. It was, uh, the servicemen were welcome wherever they were. In fact, Chicago opened their hearts and their doors to them. Even during the war, there was a constant feeling of optimism with everyone. Uh, we, we always thought positive. We never thought of any negative things that would happen. We uh, worked for a common goal. Uh, we wanted the world to be a better place to live in, and anything we could do to, to accomplish that, we tried. Some of our greatest songs were written during the war. Oh, all these sad songs of, like, I'll be seeing you, my guys come back, and the White Cliffs of Dover, all these things were very nostalgic. Part of the fun of going to the ballrooms was not only the dancing, but the intermissions. They would roll down a huge screen on the bandstand. And, and the ball would bounce on the lyrics, and so you knew when to, when to sing. It was a nice little break. Go dancing was, was the ultimate in fun. You never went out to a dinner or a high-class high place or anything that you didn't, where there wasn't dancing. If you didn't have dancing, it was just, forget it. One place that I remember dancing was the Edgewater Beach Hotel Beach Walk. The Edgewater Beach, the boardwalk, was like being in Cuba. open air, beautiful. Um, so you'd see the stars and the band sounded so good uh, with the band show behind them. It's, it was great, you know. The entertainment was constant around there because you had the Aragon, which was uh, open every evening. You had uh, the theaters all the time. And the Green Mill was a very lively place. It was a, a restaurant, a bar, and a place where you could go to dance and meet people. The Green Mill Gardens has been at Lawrence and Broadway since 1907. A lot of history here. I started here in 1938. Seven nights a week, from nine o'clock until 3.30 in the morning. We'd have a four-piece band or a three-piece band. Then in between, we'd have an organist or a piano player with a drummer and the, the beautiful singers. A lot of times, people would come uh, leave the Aragon at 12 o'clock, the dancing's over. They don't want to go home. We'd stop off at the Green Mill for a drink and listen to some good jazz music. When the other places would close up, the musicians would come over here and just let their hair down and play. Oh, it was beautiful. And people would start clapping and uh, enjoying themselves. And uh, they just uh, marveled at the music that was played here. 
Just about every tavern or lounge, if you went from Irving Park up to Howard Street, the most famous places were the Green Mill, the Cairo on Irving Park. The 1111 Club on Bryn Mawr. And they had one of, one of the greatest trombone men was there, I forgot his name. Oh, George Brunus? Oh, yeah, yeah. George Brunus was a terrific trombone Dixieland player. He played at the 1111 Club. And on you know, his night off, Monday or Tuesday, he'd come in here and he'd play that trombone. And he'd get so drunk, they'd take his pants down and play in his shorts. There were all kinds of bands. There were small combos. Uh, there were the nine-piece orchestras or the ten-piece orchestras in the ballrooms. And later, the hotel dining rooms, because it became very fashionable to dance. Every hotel had a dance band. Every hotel. In, in some cases, in two and three different rooms of the same hotel. The bands in Chicago were the thing, more than any other city in the world. It, they came up from New Orleans, and Chicago became the headquarters, even before New York. Louis Armstrong never made any money when he was playing in New Orleans. He came to Chicago and became an instant idol. People who loved to go to nightclubs in those days, they not only met their friends there, but they saw great shows and it was a way to get away out of the humdrum world and live sort of a glamorous existence for a few hours. Hey, the yeah. biggest one was the Chez Prix, of course. That was the creme de la creme of the nightclub era. That was a, a, a great place to go. They had a key club back there where members could go and you could meet all the stars. A jam-packed nightclub, and whenever you went, it was, it was full. It was hard to get in. And uh, there was a Latin Quarter and the Rum Boogie and oh, five or six other nightclubs, which I used to make every night. That was a different era completely. It was a more lively era because people were out on the street visiting, talking, and uh, <clears throat> enjoying nightclub shows. You had all the movie stars. John Barrymore, uh, Jim Keckney, uh, Bob Hope, you name them, and they were in these clubs. On the south side, there was a club, the Leisure, and Joe Lewis, the former heavyweight champ, had a club called Rum Boogie. They always had headliners. They would have a, <laughs> they'd have a, a shake dancer. <laughs> and uh, everybody would just wait for the shake dancer. Loved excitement, people, and that was a reason for this. The reason was there was no television, and if you wanted to see the stars of the period, you had to see them in nightclubs. Not that they were performing, they were also guests. Club de Lisa, most unusual club, and it, it never closed its doors. It was open 24 hours a day. What was amazing about Club de Lisa, which was, I think, at 35th and State Street, was that uh, Sunday morning when the sun was already up, they'd have a, a wild floor show calling, uh, and they called it the uh, Milkman Matinee. You know, about Club Delisa, I remember this one guy, his name was Crip Herd. The guy had one leg, and he'd come out, and the band would start to play, and this guy would literally dance on this one leg. Well, you had the kind of shows at Delisa back in the 30s and 40s, that you can't even get in Las Vegas now. You had at least nine, 10, maybe 12 acts. You had uh, every kind of act that you could describe, they had it. Guests came in from out of town, and you really wanted to take someone to a fantastic club to have a good time, you took them to Club Delisa. During those days, you'd see people out dressed to the max. I mean, the women were dressed beautifully, hair just gorgeously coiffed. You walk down 47th Street, uh, heading for the Savoy, uh, Savoy or the Regal Theater, and you saw a Easter parade. Uh, I'd go to Club Delisa, I'd go to Ramboogie, 
I go to White's Emporium. I go to Three Corners. I would go to all kinds of clubs. You could go from early evening to early morning and never run out of clubs. It was an experience, a personal experience that you can't find today. In those days, I would say it was a little more glamorous and exciting. It was wonderful in those days. The, the music and the entertainers were wonderful. That was as glamorous as anything could ever be. We thought we were really into something, man, you know. It was a wonderful experience. It was beautiful. I look at those days as being wonderful days. I miss the, the old-time orchestras, most of all. Live music is so great, you know. That was nice, real nice. I don't think there's anything comparable to it today. It was a part of our life. It was a fun part of our life. It makes me feel like I'd like to go back and do it all over again. It was such a carefree, um, exciting time. Absolutely fabulous, fabulous. It really was. It was gorgeous. The orchestra, the girls in their gowns, the fellas, the terrific dancers we had those days. Oh, those were the days. Those were the days. The music and the dancing and the girls, wow. <laughs> I guess I miss the, the closeness that people had. I miss the friendliness. Those were the romantic days, and it was a lot of fun, you know. We still talk about it all the time. It was fun. It was great. But I realize it's all gone. But to me, from my heart, it's... those were those were pleasant days.